Greetings. This Bible study is going to be on the pearl of great price. Now, I was planning on doing something a little different, but uh, this sort of came to mind, so what can I tell you? All right, let's take a look at the pearl of great price. This is probably, uh, this particular Studies probably probably been beat to death, but I'm going to throw a little different spin on it, and let's take a look. Matthew chapter 13. Actually, we're going to do two of these parables. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a tre uh, like unto treasure hid in a field. Remember that. A field. The which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in a field. All right, what's the field? Well, let's go back to Matthew 13. In verse 24, you know, we're going to let the Bible explain and interpret the Bible. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, and who's he? Christ, words of Christ in red, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. What was the good seed? Adam. But while men slept, his, enemies, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst, thou, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Now that's a good question. You know, when a farmer goes out and plants a crop, there's a bunch of weeds there. You're like, what in the world is this? I didn't plant these weeds, you know. Verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. See, that's what happens. When the weeds get a certain size, start pulling up the weeds, the, the roots of the weeds that are uh, intermeshed with the roots of the wheat, you pull up the weeds, you're going to pull up the weed, uh, wheat also. So, what was the solution? Verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares point this out to the pre-trib rapture people. Gather ye together first the tares. The tares get bundled. Uh, they get gathered first. Now, if the pre-trib rapture was true, Jesus lied because the wheat would get gathered first. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus said, Gather ye together first the tares, the weeds, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, the disciples were kind of curious, you know, in verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? In other words, why don't you talk plainly to these people? Why, why, why are you talking to them in these riddles and parables? And, you know, what's up with that? Verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Isn't that interesting? The disciples were given understanding to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to the those that were without, it wasn't given. Isn't that something? 
All right, let's go interpret the parable of the wheat and the tares. Verse 36, Matthew 13. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and the disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. In other words, explain this to us, right? He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. And Jesus called himself the Son of Man many, many, many times. Verse 38, The field is the world. Didn't we just read that in the... Um, the field is the world. Remember that. Didn't we just read that? The field is the world. Remember the, the man found the treasure in the field and he sold all that he had? We'll get back to that. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares, the weeds, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. All right. Verse 44, back to where we started. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The field is the world, the treasure. Who's the treasure? The treasure is, is God's people. Right? The which when a man hath found, he hideth. See, Christ hides his children among the weeds in the world. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, that which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Didn't Christ give everything that he had to buy the field? Didn't he die on the cross? Didn't he leave everything that he had, his, his position up in heaven, to be born into the family of humans, Emmanuel, God with us, being born of a virgin, suffering heat, suffering being cold, maybe being hungry, thirsty. Even Christ himself said he was tired. There were times that he just was tired. All the human frailties he took on so that he could live a sinless life and redeem us from the curse of sin and death. But that's a whole nother study in and of itself. I could make that a 50-hour study if I wanted to. Hopefully, if you're a believer and you've bothered to read the Bible, um, and if you don't have time to read the Bible, I've got a simple solution for you to how to make time. Take your Talmud vision I mean, I'm sorry, your television, and throw it in the garbage. You'd be surprised at how much time you can find to read the Bible. So, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. Yeah, oh yeah. All right, so what does the Bible say about the treasure? In the book of Exodus, chapter 19, and verse 5, the Lord speaking, Now therefore, if, 
That's a big IF. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So the Lord expected his people to obey, and boy, I tell you what, that is a dirty word among the churches today. They'll throw out all kinds of words at you and, oh, well, if you obey, uh, you're, you're trying to earn your salvation. That's lordship salvation. Well, you know, if Jesus is not your Lord, he's not your Savior either. Are we going to be able to keep uh, everything perfectly as long as we're in the flesh? No, absolutely not. The flesh is dirty, tainted, spotted. But he does expect obedience. So they were to obey and to keep the covenant. Then they were going to be a peculiar treasure. In Deuteronomy 28 and verse 12, what happens when you obey and keep the covenant? It says, The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven, to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. You know, there was a time when the United States was the greatest nation that lent money to everybody. Now we're the biggest debtor nation. So do you think the United States is being obedient or disobedient? Well, according to the Bible, um, it would seem we're being disobedient. So let's see. Take a look. Let's see. Sodomite marriages, abortion. And you know, there must be something wrong with the Ten Commandments because... They're not allowed in the public schools, but yet they'll let children read Harry Potter, uh, a story about a, a wizard a, and witches, a bunch of witches and wizards practicing Satanism and witchcraft. So, you know, what can I tell you? Now, Psalms chapter 17 and verse 14. For men which are thy hand, O Lord, huh, men are the Lord's hand? From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. Huh? and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children. Children. Do you know that the, the children of, of, of the Lord's are, are the treasure? They are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babies. Isn't that interesting? Psalms chapter 135 and verse 4. For the Lord himself, I'm sorry, for the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Now we're going to find out. We're going to, we're going to take a look at who Jacob and Israel is. And the average church has no idea. Well, maybe they have an idea, but they don't teach who the children of Jacob and Israel are. For the Lord hath cho chosen. Ooh, God made a choice. That's a dirty, that's another dirty word. If you believe God makes a choice and you teach that kind of stuff, they'll call you, oh, you're a Calvinist. Ooh, but, you know, the thing is, the Bible teaches that God makes a choice. Why, why doesn't God make a choice? I mean, you know, the elections were just held not too long ago, last month. 
last year, I could say. This is uh, January 1st, 2017. They were held in November of 2016. Um, what is an election? When you elect somebody, you pick somebody, you make a choice. You have, you know, somebody is chosen. Donald Trump was chosen to be president. You know, it's not like, well, you know, we got Hillary, we got Bernie, we got Donald, uh, Ted Cruz, we've got, uh, you know, uh, you know, 13 or 14 different people. No, we didn't pick 13 or 14 different people. I mean, you know, come on, let's face it. You had uh, Cassius, you had Cruz, you had Rubio, you had Carson, you had Bush, Gilmore, Chris Christie. You know, you had all these different people running for president, you know, and Bernie and Hillary. You know, the thing is, when you make a choice, you pick one. They didn't all get elected to office. I'm sorry, that's not how election works. When you, when you have an election, you pick somebody. Well, God made a choice. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. In Proverbs 15 and verse 6, In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. Oh yeah. They may not have trouble in this life, but I tell you what, one second after they die, they got trouble. In the book of Isaiah, verse 33 and verse 6, And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength of salvation. So wisdom and knowledge of the Lord is going to be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Now, you know, the thing is, when it talks about fear of the Lord, people that hate God have no fear of him. Absolutely none. You know, they say, well, you know, billions and billions of years ago, we evolved in this and that and the other, and there is no God. The Bible declares that people like that are fools. In Romans 3.18, Paul writes, There is no fear of God before their eyes. In the book of Psalms, chapter 14, verse 1, the fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. So, you know, the thing is, they have no fear or respect for the Lord. And that's what, that's what it all boils down to. It's, you know, when you love the Lord, it's not so much fear, it's respect honoring him. In the book of John, chapter 4 and verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Do you have perfect love of the Lord? Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You know, if the blue letter Bible's right, the word love is in the Bible 280 times. That's a whole lot of love to uh, rip off the title of a Led Zeppelin song that I used to listen to when I was a kid. I don't listen to that anymore, but... In Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, the Lord says, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and, and keep my commandments. 
You know, it's funny. People will say that the Old Testament and the New Testament are totally different, but take a look at Leviticus 19, verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Didn't Jesus say that was the second great commandment? The first was love the Lord, and the second was love thy neighbor. I mean, where do people come up with this stuff? And then you got Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Huh. Okay. So, basically, right there is the, the, two, the two great commandments that Jesus spoke about, right? Uh, let's see. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9. Well, let's take a look. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 1. When the Lord thy, thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Gergesites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Now, there's a difference between, you know, if you live next door to a bunch of Satanists and cannibals, that do human sacrifice on an altar to Satan and then eat their victims, and those are your neighbors, uh, does the Lord want you to love thy neighbor? If you live next door to Satan, are you supposed to love your neighbor? No. No, people. You know, there was a reason why the Lord says, don't make any covenants with these people. These people worship Satan. They do satanic practices. I mean, they're, they're evil to the core. You know, and the church today is like, well, you know, we, we need to show them love. We need to show them love. Oh, yeah, right. So when they sacrifice your children on an altar to Satan and they decide to cannibalize them and eat them, what are you going to do? Say, God bless you and hand them a salt shaker? Really? No. No. That's why the Lord says, smite them, utterly destroy them, make no covenant with them, do not show them mercy, wipe them out. But today is a day of evil. The Christians have not fulfilled this. And like I said, the Ten Commandments are banned in the public schools, but I can teach Satanism and witchcraft no problem. Harry Potter, no problem. This is the America today. And and these fools that teach this stuff think that the Lord's going to rapture them out of here before any of the bad stuff happens to them. Remember this. Remember this. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. What gods? Satan. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. You know, it, it's interesting. is when the people in Greece got saved, they took their magic books and they burned them. Verse 6. 
For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee. Ooh. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth? The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. Hmm. What is the smallest racial group in the world today? Well, let's see. There's a, a three quarters of a billion Indians. There's a billion and a half Chinese. Uh, there's hundreds of millions of Africans, hundreds of millions of uh, Hispanic South Americans. You know, there's a very, there's just a few, I, I think there's a couple hundred million Caucasians that built the churches, printed the Bibles. I mean, there's, you know, they're the fewest of all the racial groups in the world, except for the ones that call themselves the Jews. Uh, they're the smallest racial group in the world. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of the bondsman, bondman, from the house of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy, mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Do you know what a thousand generations is? Um, what is a generation? Is it 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? I would say at least a minimum of 20 years. Because in the Bible, um, a male son was not allowed to go to war until he was 20 years old. You, you couldn't draft kids that were 18 and 19 years old, unlike what the United States does today. They had to be at least 20 years old. So the minimum of a generation would be every 20 years. So you're talking 20,000 years. Uh, let's see. And repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to them that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Oh boy, I'd sure hate to be a Satanist. Thou, thou, thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments with I, which I command thee this day to do them. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye are hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which ye swear unto thy fathers. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine and thine oil and increase of thy kine, K-I-N-E. That's an old English word for cattle and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. And thou shalt be blessed above all people. Ooh. All right, let's go back to verse 12 and read that again. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken, listen, if ye hearken to do these judgments. What are judgments? Those are God's laws. Okay? When God said, don't eat pork. Okay, it's not like, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't eat pork and keep the Sabbath and thou shalt be saved. That's not what it is. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, don't eat pork and take a day off and, you know, uh, rest, ponder upon the things of the Lord, you know, uh, you know, it's probably a good idea. You know, when the Lord tells you to do something, it's probably a good idea to do it. Um, 
that's, that's, you know, what can I tell you? Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee thy covenant and the mercy which ye swear unto thy fathers. And he will love thee, and bless thee, and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb, children, and the fruit of thy land, the, you know, the fruit and the, the food, thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, the increase of thine kine and the flocks of thy sheep and the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. And thou, uh, thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among, or among your cattle. Do you know that the United States in various times, for example, after World War I and, and uh, during World War II, fed the world. They fed the world. Do you know that there's a country in Europe called Ukraine? It's in between, uh, it's next to Poland and in between Russia and Germany. And those people, uh, prior to the Russian Revolution, communist revolution was the most Christian country in Europe. They were part of the Russian, uh, the, well, the Orthodox Church, which is, uh, they were proselytized by the Greek Orthodox Church. And the Greek Orthodox Church, they gave us what is called the New Testament, being it was written in Greek. And the thing is, they were the most persecuted church in history. So when these pre-trib rapture people start telling the Greeks about how, you know, they're they're not going to you know be suffering during the tribulation, the Greeks are like, uh, let's see, we've got the New Testament in our language that we read, and we have no idea what you're talking about. What kind of false doctrine are you guys trying to peddle upon us? Okay, you're pulling verses out of context. We can read the Bible the New Testament in our own language, Greek. Why do you think the Greek Orthodox Church has no fellowship with the Baptists in the United States and the Western world? There's a reason for that. They think they're a bunch of heretics. The Greek Orthodox Church, the Orthodox Church in Eastern Europe, has been the most persecuted church in the history of the world. Ukraine, after the Russian Revolution, scarcely a hundred years ago, not even a hundred years ago, one quarter of their population was killed by the kosher communists of Russia. They were the breadbasket of Europe. They grew the wheat that fed Europe and Russia and, and, and Germany and France and England and all those countries. They fed them. Uh, Ukraine is like the... Um, you know, Nebraska and Oklahoma and um, those country, you know, those states, the Plains states where they grow all the wheat and the corn and, you know, all that other stuff. You know, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 13 says, he's, the Lord says he, he will love us and bless us and multiply us. And the fruit of thy land, the corn, the wine, the oil, the flocks of cow, cattle and sheep and, you know, Verse 14, thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. How come every non-white nation in the world flocks to all the white countries? Why is it that all the Mexicans and Africans all want to come to America? Why is it that the Africans and Asians all want to come to America or Europe? Why is that? Because we were blessed. Well, those blessings are getting ready to be taken away. You don't see any white people running to China or Africa. So why is it racist to point these, this, these, these things out. I mean, you know, 
If I point these out, I, I get called racist. Verse 15. And the Lord shall take away from thee all sickness, and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. You know, there's a really interesting, well, there's been a series of studies that uh, people that have eaten pork a lot oftentimes get what is called trichinosis. It's a tiny worm. It embeds itself, uh, the eggs embeds itself into uh, pork. And when you eat pork, it goes into your stomach. And sometimes, you know, they'll hatch and then they'll burrow through your stomach and go into your, uh, your muscles and your brain. There's a lot of people that have problems with headaches. And when they do an autopsy on them, they find trichinosis worms in their brain. And you wonder why you get headaches? Uh, okay. And people say, well, you know, as long as you cook pork and blah, 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 blah. Well, yeah, but, you know, it only takes one. It only takes one egg. And, th and then their muscles get infected with all these worms. And your body can't uh, kill them. Your white blood cells can't kill these worms when they're embedded in your muscles. They can't get to them. You know, it's just, you know, there's a reason why the Lord said don't eat pork. Did the Lord say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't eat pork and thou shalt be saved? No. But when you listen to what the Lord says, he says, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. You know, when the Lord tells you to do things, it's probably a good idea, you know. The Lord says, don't commit fornication, don't commit adultery. Well, guess what? When you got a wife or a husband and you're faithful to them, um, and they're the only ones you've ever touched, uh, chances are you won't get venereal diseases, syphilis, uh, gonorrhea, uh, uh, herpes, and all those other wonderful diseases. Um, my sister, my older sister was, uh, she was a, she's a retired RN, registered nurse. And when I got, oh, I don't know, I was a young teen. I don't remember exactly what age, probably about 15. Um, she had the talk with me. And she told me, oh, there's over 100 venereal diseases. Oh, chlamydia, that was another one. And, uh, you know, sometimes people will have two or three of them. Can you imagine that, having two or three different venereal diseases? She had the talk with me and told me all the, you know, like there's a hundred different diseases. So, you know, um, after I had the talk, I kind of stayed away from, um, how would you say, loose women, you know? I mean, I still liked girls, but I, you know, the ones that, uh, the ones that uh, had a different boyfriend every month, I stayed away from. I generally stayed away from them. I thought that was a good idea. You know, so if you obey the, the Lord, he'll keep the diseases away from you. And let me tell you something. Syphilis? Bad news, people. Very bad news. It'll, it'll make you go blind. And uh, it'll eat your muscles. And... You know, prior to the advent of antibiotics, you couldn't church, uh, you couldn't, um, it was a death sentence. You couldn't get rid of it that I know of. I don't know how true it is, but I heard there was a, um, a when I was in the army, there was a rumor going around about uh, what they call black syphilis for the guys that were in Vietnam. And they just couldn't, they couldn't cure it. That's what I heard. I, I don't know how true it is. I don't know if it's just some soldier, you know, army tale or whatever. But uh, the guys that were messing around with all the Vietnamese women. And uh, from what I heard, the, the Vietnamese army, the North Vietnam, would uh, take these infested, infected girls and let the, you know, let the uh, GIs pass her around, you know. 
And they had a thing called black syphilis. And I heard that if you got that, the army wouldn't even bring you back to the United States. They would just leave you over in Vietnam to die because there was no cure. And they didn't want it spreading around, you know, as a health thing in the United States. I don't know how true it is, but, you know, when the Lord says to do something, it's probably a good idea to, to do it and, and, and believe it. So, verse 16. And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thine eye shall have no pity upon them, neither thou shalt thou serve their gods. For that will be a snare unto thee. What's a snare? A trap. You know, when the, uh, when the Europeans came to America, the Christians, they found the American Indians. What were they doing? Uh, basically human sacrifice to their gods, cannibalism. You know, there's a reason. There's a reason why the, uh, you know, the Christians sent missionaries to the Indians, but they didn't hear the words of the Lord. They didn't hear them. And you know, when you live next door to a bunch of Satanists, are you supposed to love them? Or are you supposed to do what the Lord says right here? Hmm. All right, in Acts 19, verse 18, And many that believed came. Believed what? Believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts. What's curious arts? Magic. I'm sure it was Kabbalah. If you don't know what Kabbalah is, K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H, uh, um, you're going to find out there's a very, very large group of people that call themselves Jews that practice this stuff. And basically it's magic, Satanism, and witchcraft masquerading as Judaism. But, uh, you know, Madonna, she's, she's a convert to this stuff. You've heard of her. Um... Check it out, if you don't believe me. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. They took their witchcraft books and they burned them, just like they did in the Old Testament. Verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve, serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Boy, I tell you what, you preach this in church today, they will kick you out. No, you don't have to do that. You don't have to walk in his ways. You don't have to serve him. Why, that's lordship salvation. Just believe. Just believe. Well, you know, everything that's found in the Old Testament, I can show you in the New Testament. It's just, uh, it's there. It's just summed up, you know, into Christ. Oh, boy. Verse Deuteronomy 11 and verse 1. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. Hmm. Deuteronomy 11.22 For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him. Ooh. Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours, from the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea, shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon, as he 
as he hath said unto you. Joshua, chapter 23 and verse 11. Now this is the word, Joshua is the name of who took over for jo uh, Moses that led Israel into the promised land. Uh, when you hear the Jews saying Yeshua, th that's their way of pronouncing this word. I'm, you know what? I'm not even sure it's the same. Uh, I, I believe it's the same word, but I'm not 100% sure. But I believe that Joshua is the correct pronunciation. Joshua 23, verse 11. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. Hmm. Love the Lord thy God. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. All right, so treasure. Let's go back to treasure. In Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In Matthew 12, 12 and 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So the treasure of the Lord now, in Matthew 13, 52, Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe... Now, what's a scribe? A scribe was a copyist of the law. They didn't have a printing presses back then. The Bible had to be copied word for word. So, can you imagine hand copying the Bible word for word? And... Uh, you know, that's what a scribe was. And believe me, the scribes, uh, they knew the letter of the law. They didn't necessarily know the spirit of the law, but they knew the letter of the law. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed in unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Well, what's the treasure? The things new is the new covenant in Christ. The things old, the old covenant of Moses, the law. So do you want the letter of the law or do you want the spirit of the law of Christ? Matthew 19, 21. Jesus said unto them, Now, there was a guy that was rich, very rich in this world. And he asked him, well, what do I got to do, you know, to get into heaven? Basically, I'm paraphrasing. Jesus said unto them, unto him, if thou will be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Hmm. Now, there's a parallel account in Mark, chapter 10, verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. So, you know, do we want treasure on this earth, or do we want treasure in heaven? You know, you could do a whole study on uh, treasure. You know, the uh, should we have should we worry about treasure on earth or treasure in heaven? All right, go to Second Corinthians chapter four. Now, Corinth Corinth was a city in Greece. You know. Verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. 
but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Boy, you want to see the handling of the word of God deceitfully, turn on uh, uh, TBN. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. But there's a whole lot of truth in that, people. Let me tell you something. When people love their gold and their silver more than they love God, the gospel's hid from them. Didn't Jesus say, you know, for where a man's heart is, there will be his treasure? You want the treasure of the earth? Do you want the treasure in heaven? But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. Boy, that's the truth. I, I don't preach myself. Neither did Paul. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What earthen vessel? Your body. Wasn't Adam created out of the, the dust of the earth? But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power of God may, may be of God and not of us. You see, one day we're going to cast off these earth earthly bodies. And that's a whole other subject to preach. So that's what it means. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, that's our flesh, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the Things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Go to the book of James. Everybody should read the book of James. James was, uh, James grew up in a household. His mother's name was Mary and his father's name was Joseph. He grew up with Jesus. He became a, um, I think he became a bishop of the church. I don't remember exactly, but uh, he, wrote, he wrote a book, the book of James. It's a book of practical living. This is one book every Christian should read and know and live by. 
Book of James, chapter 5 and verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and ye shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped up treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is kept, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. What does this mean? You hired people to work for you, and you didn't bother to pay them. Look up Kol Nidre, K-O-L-N-I-D-R-E. Look that up. The Lord Jesus said to the Jews, let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay. In other words, let your yes mean yes and your noes mean no. Look it up. That's is exactly what this is talking about here. They hired people and then they didn't pay them. They kept back their wages by fraud. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughtered. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Why did they do that? They killed him to steal what they had. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. And who's the judge? Christ. And who's the door? Jesus said, I am the door. The sheep go in the door, they find pasture, right? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, throw your TV away. Every single believer should have read the Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation chapter 22. Every single one of you. And if you haven't, you're going to probably be deceived. And there are some certain things that if you do, will condemn you to hell. You can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be condemned to hell. Believe me, there are things you can do. If you take the mark of the beast, you're in trouble, people. Don't trust clergy. Don't trust preachers, pastors. Don't trust me. Don't follow me. Follow Christ. Believe his words. Read Matthew 24. Believe it. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But, above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs, psalms. Psalm is, you know, uh, songs that honor the Lord. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Not too many churches do that. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, <laughs> we've all committed sins, and if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye might be healed. The effectual firm prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, that's Elijah, that's the um, Greek rendering of Elijah. 
Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. I did an hour and 45 minute study on the life of Elijah, and he's coming back, people. He's going to be one of the two witnesses in the, in the last days. His life is worth reading about, you know. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways, from the error of his ways, shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. That's why we should be soul winners, or at least try. Not all of us are soul winners. I'm a teacher. There's a difference. You know, I've been to Baptist churches where they thought everybody should be a soul winner. Well, that's great. When you get a soul winner, you get a baby in Christ. But the teachers take the babies and turn them into soldiers. And what would you rather have against an army? Soldiers or a bunch of babies? I tell you what, one soldier of the devil can kill many, 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 many babies. Babies can't even lift up a sword. How are they going to fight? They can't. They perish. We need soldiers, people. We need soldiers. All right, let's go back to the beginning, Matthew chapter 13, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. You know, I've already gone an hour, and uh, I, I was the purpose of this Bible study was to do on the uh, the pearl of great price, but uh, as usual, I get carried away. Um, so I think I'm going to do is make this a part one, and then we'll continue with the uh, pearls on part two. So please stay tuned. I guess you could say I'm going to do a part two. And uh, we'll finish. We'll finish this up. So, all right. Well, in John eight twelve, Jesus said, "I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life." And Jesus is that light of life. Satan is that darkness. He's not called the Prince of Darkness for nothing even though he's called an angel of light. But all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.